today as we come to the table. Guys, the tracks that we leave spiritually and in this world, the tracks we leave, our kids are going to walk in those tracks. And here's the good news. Mom and dad, some of you right now are saying, look, I haven't left very good tracks for my kids. Maybe you haven't, but here's the good news. Now you can start leaving better tracks because you can turn those tracks now into godly tracks and our kids see that and our kids respect that. And then we begin to pray for our kids. God can bring our kids back in line, but it depends on whether or not we get ourselves back in line. Now, I'm not saying that our walk depends on our kids. I'm saying it greatly influences our kids. And so we need to make sure what tracks are we leaving? Are we leaving track to godliness or tracks to ungodliness? You may think your kids won't notice when you let out an expletive while driving until the next time they accidentally drop a toy and here comes the same word. Kids are like sponges. If you've been blessed with the privilege to be a parent, don't waste it. You need to be purposeful about setting a good example. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table. The daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. How can you set a good example? Is it really even worth it? How can you model godliness in a world that is so full of distractions and bad influences? As Pastor Mark will remind us in today's message, we can't do this on our own. You're going to need to be intentional about seeking the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter four with today's edition of Come to the Table. open up to Genesis chapter 4. As we continue on through the book of Genesis and we come to which line are you in today? And that is looking at the godly line and the ungodly line. We actually are going to be covering verses 17 through 26, but why don't we start together reading in verse 16 and then we'll go back and look at it in more detail. It says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begat Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methushael, and Methushael begat Lamech. And then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Adah, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Adah bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of those who play the harp and the flute. And as for Zilhah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Namah. And then Lamech said to his wives, Adon and Zilhah, hear my voice. O wives of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Well, where we left off last week, you remember we were talking about the fact after Adam and Eve had fallen, and they had had children, and now the earth is beginning to expand. They're beginning to have children. They're beginning to branch out. God is beginning to populate the earth through Adam and Eve and through their descendants. And we saw last week, remember, that Cain had chosen to go the way of the ungodly rather than going the way of the righteous. God had given him a choice, and he had killed his brother. Remember Abel, who was living righteously? Cain was not living righteously. God came to Cain and said, all right, Cain, you can either follow the way of God and you can turn from sin because it's waiting to conquer you, or you can go the way of sin and give in. And sadly enough, as we saw last week, Cain gave in and went the way of sin. And we ended there in verse 16 and really a rather sad verse. It said, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Notice God didn't make Cain leave. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. And he dwelt in the land of Nod, which means basically the land of wandering or nothingness. And 
and left the Garden of Eden. So we see this departure now of man from this place that God designed for him from the Garden of Eden, now heading off into his own way. I'm not going to do it God's way. I'm going to do it my way. And I don't want to follow God. And we see this division taking place. And that really covers what the title of today's message is. And that is, which line are you in? Because now we're going to see the Bible begin to make a clear distinction between those who walk in the godly line and those who walk in the ungodly line. And we're not just talking about genealogically and literally in our own flesh down here. Again, obviously in the spiritual sense. And so we see this theme now take form right here, if you will, in the scriptures. And now it follows all the way through the Bible until currently where we are today. And the bottom line is there's still a godly line today and there's an ungodly line today. And with this many people in here today, there's probably some in both camps. And so the challenge for us is going to be, number one, this morning is what line am I in? And number two, how do I get in another line? If you're like me, you've spent most of your life out of line. (laughs) Well, now it's time to get in line, but in line with God the proper line, and that is the godly line. The Bible says there are basically two lines in which we find ourselves in life. And again, the godly line and the ungodly. There's not a lot of gray between there. There's two lines. Now, there's a lot of uh, uh, personality, and there's a lot of differences within those two lines. You get within the godly line, you've got all kinds of people. You get within the ungodly line, you've got all kinds of people and different levels of ungodliness and different levels of godliness in the godly line. But the bottom line is there are only two lines. And these two lines will determine our eternity and our destiny. If we choose to obey God and his word, we're in the godly line. If we choose to disobey God and his word, then we're in the ungodly line. So it's not hard to figure out. It's just a matter of honesty and finding out where we are with God. And again, as we said today, we're going to see both lines, the godly line being presented in Seth and the ungodly line being presented in Cain. Now we'll see more of Seth's godly line later on as we work through Genesis. Today it'll mostly be focusing on Cain and where Cain is, but we'll still see that division before we're done. Now, again, our earthly line deals with our lineage and our spiritual line, notice this, deals with our choices. What's my point? Here's the point. You didn't choose who your mom and dad were. That was all done before you were ever born. You can't have say in what lineage you're going to be in. You can't change that. However, Once you are born, and once you are born into this world, whatever lineage you have, now you can make a choice as to what line you're going to be in for eternity. You see, the families we have down here are only temporary. Yes, they're our families. We love them. It's blood family. And if they know the Lord and we know the Lord, it will be eternal family in Christ. But as far as this single unit family, it's a temporary family while we're down here. But the family that you need to make your choice about is what eternal family you're going to be involved in. And the line that you stand in down here, if it's the ungodly line, you're choosing the ungodly family to spend eternity with. If it's the godly line, you're choosing the godly family to spend eternity with. And that's something that we have a choice. No matter what family we're born in, we have a choice as to what line we're going to follow when it comes to the spiritual sense. Again, we see Cain walking away last week, and we see that he made his choice, and now we'll see God reestablish this godly line, if you will, through Seth. Now remember, God promised Eve, Adam and Eve, really, back in Genesis 3, after the fall, that he would give a godly line. He would, give, he would bring a godly seed on the scene. He said, you know what? The seed will be the Messiah. It was the promise of the Messiah there in Genesis 3.16, that the Messiah was going to come one day. And he said that this seed, if you will, will crush the serpent's head. He'll defeat Satan and the enemy, although his heel will be bruised, which again was having to go to the cross and be crucified. But he would have the victory spiritually giving us a godly line and giving us hope for mankind back into heaven. And so again, now we see Adam and Eve having their children, Cain and Abel. Eve thinking that Abel's going to be that one, that godly line. Cain kills Abel. And now God today is going to reestablish that godly line once again through Seth. So let's look at it now. Look with me there in verse 17. It says, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now notice Cain knew his wife. That just literally means they had physical relations and they began to have children. But now that brings up a question, and this is probably one of the most commonly asked Bible questions in history, and that is, where did Cain get his wife? Maybe you have that question today. Maybe you've wondered that question. Maybe you never thought about it until now. But the Bible gives a very clear and easy explanation once we look at the facts of history and of Scripture. Now, the first thing we need to realize and remember is this. The Bible says that early man lived hundreds of years. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. How did man live hundreds of years? I I didn't know the Bible literally meant man lived hundreds of years. Yes, the Bible teaches that man lived literally hundreds of years. And then you'll say, well, okay, well, how do you explain that? Because today we don't live hundreds of years uh, currently. So what changed? Well, there's very clear biblical and scientific explanations for that. 
And again, number one, first of all, understand this. God created mankind to live forever. God never created mankind with the intent of dying. He knew man would sin. He knew death and sin and decay would enter and that man would die. But when God created man, he created us to live forever. Even your bodies today, whenever you get a cut, what happens? Your body begins to go get to work. It gets busy. It starts working on that cut and eventually it'll scab over. And then the scab turns back into skin. And scientists even tell us that the skin rejuvenates every so many years. You have brand new skin that comes to the top. Now, why when we get older, it doesn't look brand new? I don't know. I wish it did, but it doesn't. But we know that it does rejuvenate because God created our bodies, as the Bible says, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And God created us to rejuvenate. And so again, we were created to live forever. So living hundreds of years for someone who's supposed to live forever, that's not an astounding thing. What is more astounding to me is why don't we live that way now? Well, the answer to that is simply this. The Bible says that when sin entered the world, death and decay entered with it. And although God designed man to live forever, death and decay entered, and now we decay gradually, and eventually we die. Now, you might say, well, why don't we live, say, 200 years now, since we used to live 900 years? Almost 1,000 years, it says, that man used to live. So why don't we live like two or three or 400 years? Well, unless we stayed in good health, personally, I wouldn't want to. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't, and if we stayed in good health, that would be great. Now, I know that when they lived hundreds of years, they did stay in good health. So we know that was part of the case because we see they were having children all the way up until later, later in the years. They were strong. They were healthy. But what changed all that? Well, as the bloodline was tainted, again, man began to have mutations and deformities and things because sin entered, which would affect man's longevity because now disease would begin to enter. Illness would begin to enter. And all these other things would begin to enter, which would now begin to shorten man's lifespan. And it's interesting when we get to it in Genesis after the flood, we find out that immediately after the flood, man started drastically living less and less years. From living hundreds and hundreds, there's a sudden drop off in the Bible of the longevity of man right there after the flood. Now, why is that? Well, it's interesting. It tells us in Genesis that there was a canopy of water that surrounded the earth before the flood. And a canopy of water large enough to have flooded the entire earth, as well as the springs of the ocean being released, scientists say that the canopy would have been thick enough to have blocked all radiation coming into the earth. Which means before the flood, we had this protective wall around the earth in the atmosphere that was guarding us from all of the ultraviolet rays coming in from other planets, coming in from the sun, etc. And now we know by science that indeed radiation ages us. And so we have all these radiation agents now coming in. They're not blocked by this protective canopy that used to surround the earth that the Bible says was released and poured out at the flood. And so now we have the extra uh, effect on our bodies that way as well as death and disease. And so we finally have leveled off to a place to where man lives at a, at a, a certain level of longevity. So again, very easy to explain, but we need to understand that before we can talk about where Cain got his wife. Because if we don't understand that, it can be very confusing. In Genesis 5, 4, it tells us that over these hundreds of years that Adam and Eve lived, it says they had sons and daughters. Now imagine this. The first man and woman ever created, they, they, are, they have a pure bloodline until it's tainted. They're probably two of the strongest humans that ever lived. The Bible says they lived hundreds of years. Uh, they stayed healthy for hundreds of years, intended to live forever had it not been for sin. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And the Bible tells us they had sons and daughters. Now let me ask you a question. I don't know how long, how long you've been married or how many kids you have. But if you lived hundreds of years and didn't try to keep from having them, how many would you have? The bottom line is they were able to have lots of children over hundreds of years. And as the children were farther and farther down the line, they would be less and less close relatives, distant cousins, etc. down the line. And so the explanation becomes very clear as we begin to understand that. As a matter of fact, there are those who have done their mathematical calculations... And no one can say for sure what size the families were, but on the lowest end of the scale, scholars say that by the time Cain died, there would have been at least 120,000, if not as many as a million or more people on the earth. And so understand that while Cain was here, it wasn't just like he's walking around going, you know, you know honey, who are going to marry? I don't know. There's like me and like her. I mean, it wasn't that kind of thing. It was like a lot of people at that time. Now for Adam, he didn't have that many choices, but God, you know, took care of that either way. The point is, is that by the time Cain got married, it doesn't tell us how long it was that this happened. It doesn't tell us how far down the road. It doesn't tell us how many hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands were people on, were on the earth at this time when this took place. But again, we can see that Cain would have had quite a large choice when it came to who would be his wife. And there would have been plenty of, of women around to be wives at that time. Now, this brings up another question. But wouldn't Cain have had to marry one of his sisters? Yuck! Right? Isn't that what everything said? Marry his sister? Come on! Well, again, remember the mindset was different back then. 
Guys, all they knew was is they were newly created. Suddenly they were born. Here they were, and this was the world they were in. It wasn't a matter of, oh, yuck, that's my sister, you know, and you know, you, you've been bugging me since we were little. It wasn't that type of approach. This was what they saw the world to be and what they realized it to be. And also remember this, because the second question is, but Mark isn't that incest. It wasn't at that point. God had not forbidden marriage between brothers and sisters until the law came, which was much later with Moses. And again, the reason being, one of the reasons is, is God had to populate the earth. God did not make it something that was wrong until that time. And I believe at the time God made it wrong, God made it something that is repulsive to our nature. And the reason he made it repulsive to our nature is because, again, we know now that, again, with inbreeding, there are deformities, greater deformities and greater uh, genetic problems. There wouldn't have been the greater risk of genetic problems because the bloodline would have still been so pure with Adam and Eve at the very beginning. So again, the mutations wouldn't have had a chance to advance to the state they did. When they did, God said, all right, now that's it. This is wrong. You can't do that. And earth can go on without that. And it was well populated by this time. So again, uh, as hundreds and thousands of more and more distant relatives came on the scene, marriage would have been less and less among immediate family. It would have only been for a short amount of time that you would have seen that type of thing. And so Cain, if you want the answer to that, married one of his sisters. But again, under the circumstances, we see that that would not have been an unusual or a you know, gross-out thing at that time as it would be for us today. Now, notice next, Cain uh, named his son here. It says he had a son, he named his son Enoch, and then he built a city and named the city after his son. Now remember, Genesis is the book of beginnings. You see the first of everything in Genesis. And so again, we see the first city here that was ever recorded being built. And so you'll see a lot of firsts as we go through the book of Genesis. But notice here, he takes on his dad's name. That is, he's born into the family. And understand that in Bible times, your name represented who you were. And this is going to come into play when we talk about the ungodly line and the godly line. You see, when you took someone's name, that represented your character. In other words, here's how Cain is. This is how Cain's children will be. And that's how people viewed it. Your family name was who you were. It meant your character, everything you, that you existed of. Even today, when we think about Jesus and we think about his name, it's not just a name, it's who he is. It's who he embodies. It's who he represents. And so he has the name of the father on him. And here Enoch again has the name of the father, which means he's taking on his father's character. Now, why is that important? Because if the dad is rebellious and evil, like we know Cain was, what are the kids usually going to be like? Rebellious and evil. Now, it doesn't mean always. Some of you come from a family where your parents may have been away from God. They may have been in the ungodly line, and yet here you sit today knowing Jesus Christ and in the line of God and serving Him. Now, why did you do that? Because God gave you the ability to choose, and you can choose now by that choice what line you're going to be in. But for the most uh, part, we are like our parents. We are raised like our parents, and this really is, is why it is so important for us as moms and dads to make sure that we're raising our children in a godly way. Because dads, moms, our children are going to follow in our footsteps. It doesn't mean that God can't intervene and head them a right way if we direct them a wrong way, but nine times out of ten, they follow in our footsteps. I heard a true story of a dad who was caught in a snowstorm one night. He couldn't drive his car, but he wanted to go get some alcohol. He wanted to sit and just get drunk. And so he decided to go out. The kids were in bed. Everybody was asleep. He put on his snow clothes and started walking out in the snow, and he said he felt this eerie feeling that somebody was behind him watching him. And you know you have that feeling when somebody's staring at you. And so he said, suddenly he turned around in the quiet of the night, in the quiet of the snow, and hearing this, and he looks back, and he sees his son behind him, wearing his pajamas and his snow boots, following along behind his dad. And he noticed there weren't any tracks other than his dad's tracks, because the snow was so deep, and his son so little, he had made a point to put his foot right in the place where his dad's feet had been, so he could walk right where his dad was and not have to fight the snow. And he said to his son, what in the world are you doing? You're supposed to be in bed. And he was kind of upset because his son's out of bed and he kind of felt bad because what he was going to do. And his son said, dad, I just saw you going this way and I wanted to follow in your footsteps. And what a picture that gives us of exactly where we are with our children. Guys, the tracks that we leave spiritually and in this world, the tracks we leave, our kids are going to walk in those tracks. And here's the good news. Mom and dad, some of you right now are saying, look, I haven't left very good tracks for my kids. Maybe you haven't, but here's the good news. Now you can start leaving better tracks because you can turn those tracks now into godly tracks and our kids see that and our kids respect that and then we begin to pray for our kids. God can bring our kids back in line, but it depends on whether or not we get ourselves back in line. Now I'm not saying that our walk depends on our kids. I'm saying it greatly influences our kids. And so we need to make sure what tracks are we leaving? Are we leaving track to godliness or tracks to ungodliness? Are we setting the right direction or are we setting the wrong direction for the kids? You know, it's interesting. Speaking of setting the wrong direction, I read an article here uh, just recently about a, a little girl that had, had lightning strike her house and catch her bed on fire. 
And the example that our parents set for this, again, uh, some elements of the story are, 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 it's humorous to me because of how it was exposed because it ended up being told to two newspapers and one TV station of what was personally and privately going on in their home. But again, with the example set, you can tell the way they're going to go. It says, Kaylee Schreiner, seven, was sleeping in her own bed in the town of Tonganoxie. What a name. Tonganoxie, Kansas, 25 miles west of Kansas City when a bolt of lightning struck her house on the morning of June 30th. A jolt went through the roof into the house's frame, down the metal beam into the steel springs of Kaylee's mattress, which was touching a bedroom wall. Kaylee told the Lawrence, Kansas Journal World that a loud noise woke her up and her bed got very hot all of a sudden. She opened her eyes and saw flames coming out of her mattress. So she and her, she and her sister, uh, Kristen, five years old, ran to tell her parents, my mom thought I was on fire, she said, but I wasn't, it was my bed, she told KMBC TV of Kansas City. Then dad was coming down the hallway and we said, dad, dad, our room is on fire. My bed is on fire. And the dad said, I saw smoke coming off of Kaylee's hair. And and he told the Tonganoxie mirror, she had frizzy hair and was puffed full of smoke. She had soot on her face and sheetrock in her hair. And then Kaylee described her parents' reaction. Notice this reaction. You're talking about being exposed to what's going on in the home. She tells the newspaper and the TV this. Well, first, dad said a bad word. Then mom heard it, and she went upstairs and said a bad word, and then there were bad words everywhere. (laughs) That's on the TV to hear about your family. You know, the Bible says your sin will find you out. Now, yes, we laugh about the fact that God exposed their sin, right? For all the newspapers and all the little girl, well, here's what happened. Daddy might say, well, honey, honey, you know. But guys, here's my point. Listen, dad and mom don't realize the example they're setting for little Kaylee and Kristen. Because what they're going to learn is, oh, that's how I'm supposed to react when these situations come along. See, here's the lesson we need to learn. The example we set, even in things we may think are small things, whether they're small or large things, that's the example our kids are going to follow. And so we need to be setting a godly example for our kids. Well, Cain set the example, and we're going to see that his kids follow in his footsteps. Notice verse 18, to Enoch was born Arad, to Arad begat Mahujael, Mahujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And then Lamech took for himself two wives. Now, again, before we even get to this whole Lamech story, notice this here about the genealogy. You have all these genealogies and all these names. And again, as we get into Genesis, you're going to see these genealogies falling into place. And you're going to begin to think, why in the world are we having all these genealogies, uh, you know, in, in the Bible? There's a reason for that. I mean, you start reading the Bible, you think you're doing good. Somebody says, start in Genesis, right? And you start reading through Genesis. and You have all these begats and all these names you can't pronounce, and you think, why in the world did God put this in the Bible? Understand, God needed to keep a traceable line all the way back to the promise he had made to Eve. He said, Eve, I'm going to give you a seed. And when that seed comes, that promise of Jesus Christ, there need to be a traceable line all the way back. And then when you get to Abraham and you get to David, you find out as well, God said, I promise through your direct line, he's going to come. So there had to be a provable line. So the genealogies have a very specific purpose in Scripture. And although sometimes they can be tedious, they certainly have a point and a reason Uh, for being there. Now, again, notice it says here in verse 19 that Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Adah and the name of the second was Zilhah. Now, once the ungodly line goes far enough down the road, they become emboldened to go even farther. Well, our time at the table of God's word has come to a close for today. But what are some things you gained from what you heard. The book of Genesis gets the ball rolling, causing you to think about all kinds of big picture questions, things related to the creation of the world, why God would allow a worldwide flood, and why were the Israelites his chosen people. These are all good things to think about and to dig further in God's word. But our hope is that what you heard today has helped solidify some things that might have been in question before. God was specific in how he brought things about. None of it was accidental or haphazard. As you listen through this series, we trust that you'll come to some great realizations about who God is and what he's done and is doing. To listen to this message again or share with a friend, go to thewaymedia.net. Once again, that's thewaymedia.net. Simply click on the Come to the Table tab. If you have some questions about what you heard today, we'd love to pray for you or answer any questions you may have. So reach out to us through the questions and comments link on our website or call us at 865-609-1385. That's 865-609-1385. Please don't hesitate to reach out. 
we encourage you to stay grounded in God's Word, allowing Jesus to grow you and draw you closer to Him daily, being willing to go where He's guiding you. Pastor Mark has prepared another teaching here in the book of Genesis. So join us again the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.